Okay, members of council, if you can please take your seats. I'd like to call this meeting in order. Okay, members of council, please rise for the national anthem. Please remain standing and during this time, please remember the following persons who have passed away. Rishi Batia, Jeanette Aileen Foster Gaskin, Robert Fredrickson, and Barry Trink. Thank you. <coughs> we acknowledge the land we are meeting on, it on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. For the benefit of those who are connected to the internet, the City Clerk has posted all of the agenda materials for today's meeting at toronto.ca slash council. I will now call for a motion. I will now uh, call for a motion to confirm the minutes. Councillor Lai. That City Council confirm the minutes of Council from the regular meeting held on March 27 and 28, 2019, in the forms applied to the members. Thank you. All in favor, recorded vote. Councillor Holliday, please. Councillor Lai and Councillor Bailao. Councillor Lai. Councillor Lai, I apologize, your button's not working. How do you vote, ma'am? Okay. Okay. 
the motion to confirm the minutes carries unanimously. The vote is 19 in favor. Thank you. I will now call upon the committee chairs to introduce the reports. The chairs can speak about the reports for up to five minutes. Mayor Tor, you have a motion to introduce the executive committee report. I do, Madam Speaker. I move that the report for meeting four of the executive committee listed on the agenda of council be presented for uh, consideration. Uh, there are a number of items uh, that are in the report, uh, Speaker, uh, but I want to just focus on two. Uh, the first of which we'll deal with first thing this morning, which is that of the King Street pilot. Uh, and of course, we're at the stage now after all the time that we have spent uh, in uh, uh, initiating this and in uh, measuring it uh, to make this permanent. And I think that uh, it is a time to do that. The executive committee certainly felt that way unanimously. And I think uh, it is something that the people of Toronto expect us to move forward with. I make no apology for the fact that we have tried to do it in a way that was careful, that was deliberate, uh, that was measured uh, as many ways as anything could possibly be measured, and that when you take all those measurements into account uh, and take into account the impact that it's had on people, uh, that it is something that we should move forward. That doesn't mean there aren't challenges that remain, and indeed, if you look at uh, the uh, recommendations, there's one at the end, as I, as I recall, that says we're going to continuously monitor this and continuously find ways to continue to invest in the street, in the public realm, in improving the transit, and for that matter, in working with the businesses there to make sure uh, that uh, they are thriving and that King Street remains uh, and improves, uh, is, is improved upon as a destination uh, in the city uh, for people to go, whether it's uh, residents or tourists. But the bottom line is, that the third uh, busiest transit route in all of the city, behind only the two main subway lines, the busiest surface transit route in North America, is now working much, much better as intended. And is not only working better for the people who were using it when we started this, 72,000 of them, but is now working better for 84,000 people. And if you look at one of the principal objectives we have as a council, as a city, which is to get people to use public transit more, uh, we have facilitated that with this uh, with this uh, initiative. And so I think that we are, by making this permanent, making uh, in and of itself an investment in King Street, an investment in the city, an investment in uh, public transit, and one that had fairly immediate results with a relatively minimal investment in dollars uh, for the city. Uh, Madam Speaker, the second thing that we'll address uh, today as my second key item is the report coming from our officials on transit. And I believe that what we will do today is continue to move forward our transit expansion plans. However, uh, obviously, there has been some uh, further consideration that we're going to need to give to uh, some of the items uh, in that report on account of the announcement made by the province. And I will say this about that announcement. First of all, it is obviously always welcome when any of the other governments make uh, specific uh, announcements of billions of dollars to help build transit in Toronto to help get the city moving uh, and to help uh, address some of the issues that we here have been addressing in a careful way uh, for some considerable period of time. And I'm also very much of the view from the experience that I've had here and even from watching uh, from some distance away when I was uh, head of civic action and so on that only three governments working together can get transit built. If anyone is missing um, or if anyone is trying to do it on their own, it's not going to succeed. And I think that our job in the next day or two is going to be to frame a number of questions, and there are quite a few of them uh, that we have with respect to last week's announcements because we were moving forward on a plan that we had methodically moved forward, and there were some disagreements uh, in this uh, chamber about some of the elements of that plan, but the bottom line is I think everyone has conceded in the last number of days we were moving that plan forward. Now there are some proposals to alter those plans, and we're told those alterations are going to be for the better. And I don't think we're in any position to necessarily judge that, certainly not in the absence of answers to a lot of questions about those plans, answers which have not yet uh, been provided to us. And so I hope that we're going to take the opportunity in our debate the next day or so uh, to uh, answer those questions or to get answers to those questions or to at least frame them so we can go to the only place where we're going to get the answer, Speaker, which is to the table that we're sitting at with the province and where we can put those questions to them in writing and in person and hopefully obtain answers that are satisfactory. And the one that is at the top of that list, of course, uh, is the relief line and all the questions that exist about the proposal to take the relief line, as we called it and as, as it has been called for some time and which was moving forward in a certain way, and now to change that to the Ontario line. And I think there's an awful lot of questions that are outstanding about that because we hadn't had the chance to sit and ask those questions before, and now we do. 
and now I'm proposing that it's, it's the time to do that over the next few months so that we can understand exactly what is being proposed and understand something that I've said from the beginning, as everybody here has, which is that in order to judge those things, we judge them through the lens of whether they're good for the City of Toronto, good for the TTC riders, good for the employees, and good for the people uh, of Toronto. And so I think this uh, continuing to have these discussions and ask these questions and expect uh, reasonable answers is the best way we can protect our transit system and the best way we can not delay the progress that we have made on expanding that system. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Cressy, would you introduce the Board of Health report? Uh, thank you, Speaker. That the report from meeting four of the Board of Health listed on the agenda be presented for consideration. Uh, we dealt with a number of items at the Board of Health this month, but I'll highlight a couple in particular because it has been a very busy month and few months at the Board. Uh, the first is an item I wish we did not have to deal with, but alas, we do, and that's vaccines. Uh, we have witnessed an increase in vaccine hesitancy in this city and this country, and uh, a level of vaccine hesitancy that is sweeping across North America and Europe and resulting in deaths. And we know from the Medical Officer of Health and experts that immunization has been the most significant health care intervention of any in the 20th and 19th century. And so as the Board of Health, we will be working to confront vaccine hesitancy. But just as pressing, and it's here today at Council, is as it relates to overdose. Since I rose to speak about overdose a month ago, uh, we have new data. And in the month of March in the City of Toronto, 22 people died of overdoses, 22. Uh, and we had 452 EMS calls for overdose, the highest ever since we began tracking. The Medical Officer of Health has called the overdose crisis the most significant public health crisis of our generation, a crisis where we are losing 11 people every single day in this country. 11 people are dying every single day of deaths that are preventable. And in that crisis, two of nine sites located in the City of Toronto, overdose prevention sites, have recently lost their funding and been told to close down. Uh, it's wrong, it's callous, and there is a motion on the agenda to reverse that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Min and Wong, you have a motion to introduce the Civic Appointments Committee report? Yes, thank you. That the report from meeting five of the Civic Appointments Committee listed on the agenda be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, you have a motion to introduce the Economic and Community Development Committee report? Uh, yes, and good morning, Speaker. Good morning, everyone. That uh, the report from meeting three of the Economic and uh, Community Development uh, Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Uh, speaker, I would just like to um, add comments on two items on the agenda. Um, the first is the uh, Poet Laureate, which um, uh, Council will be approving today. would like to simply thank um, the outgoing Laureate, uh, sorry, the photo laureate as opposed to the poet laureate. We have a number of laureates. It's the photo laureate that we're dealing with at this particular uh, meeting. Uh, Jeffrey James, I want to thank him for his great contribution that he has made as being the city's uh, first um, photo laureate. And I'd like, um, uh, Speaker, to, uh, to welcome, uh, and Council will hopefully ratify this today, uh, Michelle Pearson, Pearson Clark um, as the second photo laureate um, to the city of Toronto. She has an extensive uh, body of work that she has been involved with, um, uh, one of those being um, Here um, We Are Here, uh, a black Canadian contemporary art exhibit as at um, um, Musique uh, uh, Beaux, Beaux des Art uh, in uh, Montreal, and also um, all that is left unsaid at the LTD Los Angeles um, uh, um, Theater or such. And also Suck Teeth Composition um, that was actually at the Royal Ontario Museum. And then finally, Speaker, we are dealing today with the noise uh, bylaw. It's being held by Councillor Cressy. 
I simply wanted to thank the staff who have spent a considerable number of um, years working on this particular um, item. It is uh, a challenge that I believe that they have uh, not gotten it perfectly, and I see Carlton's nodding his head and so he recognizes that. Um, I've looked at all the other bylaws in other jurisdictions in New York in particular, they didn't get it perfectly either. But I think this is as perfect as we can get it at the moment. There are some fine tuning that has to be done. I believe we'll be able to do that here today. But I simply wanted to acknowledge the great work that the staff uh, have done in this particular area and to simply say thank you very much for your professionalism and thank you for the efforts and the time, all the meetings that we've had with the public uh, and the community at large and so on in order to try to get this issue right. It's uh, unfortunate that we can't have an absolutely quiet city, but with respect to our efforts in terms of creating uh, wealth and mobility and so on, there are challenges, there are ambient noises that some people are not very happy with, and then there are other extensive element of noise that we're trying to deal with. I think um, what we have here today in front of us is a, um, a resolution that has come through a tremendous amount of effort and so on with the staff that I believe is in the right direction. And as we move forward, clearly we'll be doing more to um, get it as right as we can. So again, thank you to the staff for the great work. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley, you have a motion to introduce the General Government and Licensing Committee report. Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, that the report for meeting number three of the government, General Government Licensing Committee listed on the agenda be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the Infrastructure and Environment Committee report. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. From the, the, that the report for meeting three of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Bylaw, you have a motion to introduce the Planning and Housing Committee report. Councillor? That the report from meeting four of the Planning and Housing Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Layton, you have a motion to introduce the new business for city officials. Yes, thank you very much that the new business from city officials listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of the motions, recorded vote. <laughs> Councillor Bailao, please. motions to introduce the reports carry uh, unanimously 22 in favor thank you councillor Cressy I understand you have a procedure motion at this time uh, th thank you speaker I have a procedural motion if I could introduce we had a special meeting of the Board of Health which was yesterday uh, in order for the items from yesterday to be dealt with today uh, we have to introduce it to add it to the agenda So, Councillor Crest, maybe you can mention the item. Oh, uh, the item is consideration of the 2019 provincial budget. Okay, recorded vote.
Motion to add HL 5.1 to the council agenda. Carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Are there any declarations of interest? Please indicate the committee, the item or motion number and the nature of the interest. And remember that you must also file a written declaration of your interest with the city clerk. So if you can put your name up, request a question staff, if you, uh, Councillor Lai. Oh. Yes, Madam Speaker. I have a conflict on uh, EC 3.6, noise by law. I have actually declared my conflict at the Economic and Community Development Committee. I get compensated and will continue to be compensated for various transactions that I traded before elected to city council by one of the deputants. Okay, thank you. I will now call for petitions. Are there any petitions at this time? Councillor McKelvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today I would like to present three petitions that call for City Council to build the Eglinton East LRT to Malvern Center. Combined, the petitions contain the names of approximately 264 individuals representing 20 wards across the City of Toronto. This includes 66 residents of Ward 25, Scarborough Rouge Park, 44 residents of Ward 20, Scarborough Southwest, 39 residents of Ward 24, Scarborough Guildwood, 22 residents of, tw of Ward 21, Scarborough Center, and 17 residents of Ward 23, Scarborough North. In addition, my office has received an additional 250 uh, electronic petitions. The petitions read, on May 7, 2018, Mayor Tory promised to extend the Eglinton East LRT from Kennedy to Malvern Town Center. The Eglinton East LRT would bring rapid transit and economic renewal to the neighborhoods of Kennedy Park, Eglinton East, Scarborough Village, Guildwood, West Hill, Highland Creek, Morningside, and Malvern. The project will also connect three of Scarborough's anchor institutions, the University of Toronto Scarborough, Centennial College, Morningside Campus, and the Toronto Pan Am Centre to, to rapid transit. It's time to connect the communities to our existing rapid transit network. The Eglinton East LRT could be built faster, less expensively than a subway, and would be within walking distance to 40,000 residents. If delivered, operated, and maintained publicly by the TTC, the Eglinton East LRT would provide better access to jobs across Toronto and good jobs in Scarborough. Please vote to fund and build the Eglinton East LRT publicly now. Thank you, madam. Thank Chair. you. All those in favor of receiving the petitions, recorded vote. Councillor Kerjianis, when you're seated, please. The motion to receive the <laughs> petitions carries unanimously. 22 in favor. Members, I will now review the order paper. The mayor has designated item EX 4.2 headed the future of King Street results of the transit pilot and item EX 4.1 headed Toronto. Toronto's Transit Expansion Program, update and next steps as is key matters for this meeting. These will be our first and second items of business today. Members, a report is due from the City Manager on the Mayor's second key item, which is EX 4.1. If Council reaches that item before the report has been provided to Council, I will ask the Mayor if he consents to standing a second key matter down until the report has been provided to Members. Notices of motions are scheduled to be dealt with at 2 p.m. tomorrow, only if the mayor's key matters are completed. I propose that City Council set a time for a closed session if required later in the meeting. The City Clerk has noted the, I the items that members wish to hold. I will now go through the items listed on the order paper to take additional holds. I will recognize requests to make matters urgent and time specific after I go through the items for additional holds once the order paper has been approved by council. Any change will need a two thirds vote. Page three. Councillor Bylaw. Page three, Madam uh, Speaker, EX 4.3, accelerating the city's tennis first project. Four point three. Yes. First. So I've got four point three. Thank you. 
Councillor Matlow. Uh, Madam Speaker, it's, it's a point of order. Um, I was going to bring this up when we discussed the timing of items, but given that you just raised, um, uh, you just made comment on the timing of uh, EX 4.1, uh, Toronto's Transit Expansion Program update and next step steps with respect to the City Manager's Report. Uh, I point out that um, I believe that uh, members of Council uh, should have ample opportunity uh, unless, you know, unless this is uh, limited to perhaps a paragraph, which I don't believe it is, uh, that we should have ample opportunity to be able to thoughtfully review the uh, City Manager's Report and understand it uh, before uh, voting on the item. And therefore, I'd like you to consider as we approach the uh, moment when you ask uh, for timed items, perhaps you yourself uh, could designate this to tomorrow, uh, given that uh, we, I, I, I can't think of a precedent for when we haven't received uh, uh, an important uh, and a complex report uh, before, uh, the, uh, before the day that we've actually debated it. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. It is the mayor's key item. Um, so the mayor, the, uh, the mayor will be the decision of the mayor. Um, if it's not considered, then I would then raise a point of uh, privilege, given uh, that council uh, would not have, in that case, the opportunity to be able to uh, review the the information uh, in a thoughtful and appropriate way before voting on it. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, EX 4.6 2019 Education Property Tax Levy and, Levy and Clawback. Um, there's a supplementary report from staff. Uh, I'd like to uh, move that if I could, please. Thank you. Page four. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Council, so you're adopting the. Yeah, um, we can actually okay. adopt it if uh, that's. Uh, on EX uh, 4.6, it's on the screen. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. On page four, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold item CA 5.4, appointments of public members to the Exhibition Place Board, and CA 5.5, appointment of members of the public to the Toronto Zoo Board. And just to inform clerks, I think we need to go in camera on those items. Councillor. Billion. Uh, thank you. Uh, CA 5.2, I have some questions of staff that I may be able to uh, ask uh, offline. Okay, but you're holding the item down, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Can, if we can clear the screen, please. Okay. Page 5. Page five. Okay. Councillor Cressy, page five. I, I'm terribly sorry, Speaker. It's page four. If uh, Council would like, I am prepared to release with a recorded vote HL 4.9 on supervised consumption services. If people want that on a recorded vote, I'm happy to just release it. Okay. Councillor Cressy would like to release on page four uh, HL 4.9. All in favor? Recorded vote. The item carries. The vote is 20 to 2. Deputy Mayor Minnawong, I'm on page 4 or page 5? Page 5. Page 5? Okay. Uh, page 5, EC 3.8, um, authority to enter into multi-year agreements with the Toronto Arts Council. Thank you. Page 6. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On page six, item CC 6.7, 470 to 488 Wellington Street West, I'd like to hold that. Okay. Okay, that's it. I will now consider request to make items urgent and time specific. 
Councillor Matlow. So, Madam Speaker, um, regardless of what is in the report, the fact that it would only come at noon or, or, or soon after on the very day that we are meant to vote on it uh, is unreasonable. Um, so I would like to suggest, uh, and I, you know, I looked, obviously it's the mayor's second urgent item and, and it's council's uh, agenda item, uh, to put it uh, as early as possible as you'd like to designate for tomorrow morning so that we have today to, uh, this afternoon, this evening to review it. Okay, as I indicated earlier, it is the mayor's key item, so I will speak to the mayor. Councillor, it, it is the mayor's key item, Councillor Matlow, so you cannot move a motion to reorder the mayor's key item. I will speak to the mayor. Councillor Fillion. Uh, page 6, 6, CC 6.3, annual report of the Office of the Lobbyist Registrar. Um, first item, following member motions. Okay. On favor, Kerry, Deputy Mayor Minowong. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, PH 4.1, Donald's Crossing. Um, I'd like that dealt with first thing tomorrow morning. Okay. On favor, Kerry. All those in favor, pardon? So, Councillor Fillion, you, pal, you, we just moved a motion to, for a timed item on an item that wasn't held. Are you holding it? Yes, sorry. I, I didn't realize I needed to do that first. Okay. If you could reopen it, so then Councillor Fillion will hold it, and then I we'll can hold it. that motion. Okay. All right. All those in favor of adopting the order paper and all items not held, recorded vote. Councillor Fillion, please. The motion to adopt the order paper carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Members of council, I want to stress the importance of preparing your motions in advance. The clerk staff are here to help you prepare your motions. In particular, if you intend to move a motion during the release of holds, I will insist that your motion be prepared in advance and given to the clerk. If you do not have your motion ready, I will not recognize you. And I'm also remind men, reminding members that you must state your motion first before you speak to it. Member City Council follows the routine for the processing and adding of any motions without notice during the meeting. Please remember that a motion without notice must include a reason for urgency. If you have an urgent motion without notice you wish to bring forward at this meeting, please give your motion to the City Clerk staff. They will prepare the ne necessary procedure motion for my review along with your motion. The Chair must agree the motion is urgent before you can seek leave to introduce it at this meeting. It will require 18 votes to add a motion without notice to the agenda during the meeting. Motions added to the agenda in this way are not subject to a vote to waive referral to a committee or agency. I will be reviewing all motions carefully and will advise council after each recess which motions need a motion to add to the agenda. So we'll start with the mayor's first key item. And, uh, before we start the agenda, I just want to take this opportunity to congratulate the Toronto Maple Leafs for their big win yesterday. Great. And the next game is tomorrow night, so I expect us to be finished before six.
Okay. The, uh, the mayor's first key item, which is EX 4.2, the future of King Street results of the transit pilot. Questions? Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'll direct my questions to Transportation Services and TTC and let them decide who to answer. Uh, how many transit riders were there on King Street before the installation of the pilot? Uh, through the Speaker, there were 72,000 boardings per day. 72,000. At the time, was that the busiest surface level transit route in Canada? Uh, through the Chair, that's correct. All right. Uh, following the installation of the pilot, how many transit riders are there on taking the King Street car today? Uh, through the Speaker, uh, pretty much about one month after the start of the pilot, we saw an increase of 12,000 boardings a day to approximately 84,000 boardings per weekday. Uh, so we increased, by what percentage did we increase ridership on the King Street car? Daily ridership increased by 16%. Have we ever seen another transit project with a 16% increase in ridership after one month? Uh, through the Speaker, no, we have not. This is unprecedented. Thank you. Unprecedented. That's correct. Okay. Uh, was there an improvement in reliability of the streetcar since the increase, since the installation of the pilot? Uh, through the Speaker, we uh, have more predictable conditions for our streetcars to operate in the most busiest part of the route. Um, and our customers have said that uh, streetcars are coming more regularly, and we are seeing that in our statistics as well. So not only are more people riding the streetcar, but it's also more reliable. Through the Speaker, that's correct, and our service is also more productive. We are carrying more customers for every hour of service we operate on King than we did before the pilot. All right. Um, to the General Manager of Transportation Services, how has this changed the pilot, the way people move in, in and out of the downtown core? As part of the evaluation of the pilot project, we collected data across the downtown and it resulted in the total number of people moving east-west of the downtown has increased by 3% during the morning and afternoon commutes. So we've seen an increase in transit mode share by 6% and a reduction of vehicle mode share by 4%. Sorry, just to unpack that for me. So we increased the total number of people moving in and out of the core by 3% with a corresponding decrease in the number of people driving in and out of the core? That's correct. The overall increase is actually 3.2% more people coming into the downtown during peak hours with a reduction in mode share of 4% of vehicles. So, in effect, people moved out of cars and onto public transit? That's correct. Is that the purpose of this pilot? We're looking to move people more efficiently, and moving people more efficiently by transit is the way to do it. Thank you. Uh, to the general manager of transportation services, how much did this pilot cost? Uh, through the speaker, the total cost was $1.5 million as well. Uh, part of that was uh, federal dollars through the public transit infrastructure fund. So the city's investment was $750,000. So for a total investment of $1.5 million, $750,000 from the city, we moved 12,000 more people. That is correct. So on a value for money basis, has this been a success? I think the King Street pilot, uh, from a value for money basis, has been an unprecedented success. I think the uptick and interest that we've seen from across North America and the world in uh, not only our minimal investment, but also the way that we went about doing this, the create, bringing the creative community on board, the partnership that we've created that will last us well beyond this, uh, and the engagement and data that we've looked at to demonstrate all of the successful components of this project, I think I would qualify that as an uh, as a unprecedented success. And did I hear you say correctly that around the world you see this as one of the best cases of a value for money investment in transit? Based on the uh, inquiries that we've received uh, to present at conferences, uh, that we've received to talk about how we've done this, the. Um, People in my position have come to visit to look and see how we did the King Street pilot so that they could uh, replicate it in other cities like New York City and other places where they're facing similar challenges and they want to invest a little and get a lot back out of it. So cities around the world are coming. Your, uh, your compatriots, your people in your position around the world are now looking to Toronto to model what we've done on King. Absolutely. All right. Improvements going forward on a transit basis, are there plans to improve the experience for transit riders to make the pilot better? 
Mr. Speaker, uh, we understand that with the increase in demand, we are continuing to see some overcrowding, especially at the very busiest part. So we are planning on increasing service uh, through supplemental bus service and streetcars in the fall. And do we have plans to improve the public realm and to support businesses as part of the in making it permanent? Through the Speaker, the opportunity for the project to become permanent provides an opportunity for us to provide higher quality public realm in the curb lane public spaces, including permanent uh, raised patios, um, attractive and durable seating, um, enhanced lighting, parklets, more public art, seasonal programming and wayfinding, as well as additional wayfinding signage um, and illuminated LED signs. And my fa last Thank you. No, I'm sorry. You're way over time, Councillor Gressy. Thank you. Councillor Karagiannis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to staff, TTC or transportation. Right now, TTC accessible vehicles, they're allowed to go straight through if they're marked with TTC decals and, and um, their TTC vehicles? Through the speaker, uh, wheel trans buses uh, operating with our wheel trans customers are allowed through the pilot. Are our partners that are actually providing wheel trans, um, are they allowed to go straight through like the um, accessible uh, cabs? Through the speaker, um, all wheel trans customers are continuing to be dropped off on King Street. Uh, it is the accessible taxis and sedans that do not have the same exemption. However, uh, that doesn't change that all wheel trans customers continue to have access onto King Street. But the wheel trans accessible taxi cabs are not allowed to go through while our vehicles, the accessible vehicles of TTC are allowed to go through. That is correct. Um, this is primarily due to the uh, difficulty in enforcing um, a sedan uh, taxi uh, when it goes through the pilot zone. Um, I do want to add that this amounts to about 30 customers a day for all modes between bus uh, accessible transit or sorry accessible taxi and sedan is a m number of 30 pickups and drop offs per day on King Street. So if my uh, member of my family were to call the accessible and they would, they would get a, um, a wheel trans bus and they wanted to go in a certain location they should be able to go right through King Street without any, any problems correct? Uh, all wheel trans customers when they book a trip to King Street will be dropped off on King Street. My question, let me again put it to you. If they call in and they request a wheel trans and a TTC wheel trans bus was to pick them up, that bus will be able to go right through without no turn right, no turn left, straight through. Uh, through the speaker, that wheel trans bus would take the most efficient route to get to drop off its customer, and that may or may not be through through travel on King Street. They would go right through, right? They don't have to stop, or turn right, turn left, they'll go right through. Through the speaker, it depends on where that wheel trans bus is coming from, um, and it could be coming from the north, and that would not require through travel. I'm going to go Street. back to what I asked the TTC um, uh, board, and I was told that the TTC marked vehicle can go right through. Can I please, can you please advise me if what you said there is still stands here? Through the speaker, a TTC vehicle is exempt because that okay. is the bylaw that is in place. All right, so if a TTC vehicle is exempt, do you not, don't you think that a partner TTC, um, somebody that has cabs should also be given the same courtesy and the same priority? Through the speaker, an accessible and contracted either sedan taxi or accessible van taxi would be another vehicle type from a, a wheel trans bus. It, in, particularly in the case of sedan taxis, it would be impossible for an officer to enforce whether that taxi was providing contracted wheel trans service or not. So if a member of my family, and I go back again, my mother, which is a, she can take wheel trans, she wants to go on King Street and she was to happen to be sent a bus with TTC uh, wheel trans, that vehicle will right to go through. However, she was to be sent a taxi cab and or a, uh, a, a, a TTL, she wouldn't be able to go through. Would I be correct? Depending on the time of day, after 10 p.m., all taxis are exempt from the regulations. What happens at the time that they're not exempt? Please, I mean, I'm not trying to, to be hard, but let's not mince with words. Through, through, through the speaker, okay. uh, is, is, are they treated the same? 
I don't think so. Please advise me if, if that's correct. Through the speaker, my understanding of both the Wheeltran and the sedan taxis is that they're going to pick somebody up and take them to their destination point. So right now, Wheeltran's buses are, uh, are exempt from the uh, regulations. They, of course, have to follow traffic regulations. Right. But they are going to be a point-to-point -point destination, and they're going to plan their but a, trip. But an accessible. And the, it, now, yes, Master, and please don't interrupt. the other thing that we have done that is very beneficial from the uh, point of accessibility is we've increased the number of accessible drop-off zones on the curbside so that people who have accessibility issues have a quick and direct trip me, from the curbside to their, to their the destination. Again. Are TDC vehicles and TDC partner vehicles that are moving across the grid on King Street, uh, moving people with uh, disabilities, are they treated the same or one says you can go right through and the partners that are moved doing this cannot go right through? Would I be correct in that? You're correct in that, Councillor. Right. The, uh, the, this is consistent with other places where TTC vehicles are exempt, but wheel trans contracted taxis are not, such as the bus bypass lanes on the DVP, TTC bus terminals, and other bus-only roadways. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, through the chair to the general manager of transportation services, uh, could you just give us a quick brief overview of some of the biggest lessons that we learned from this project that might be transferable to other parts of the city? Uh, through the speaker, I think first off I would say that we, we can, uh, under the right conditions, make a relatively mo modest investment. Uh, we can uh, install a project of this magnitude with our own uh, largely city forces. We can engage the creative community and have an outcome that is going to be unprecedented in terms of travel time and reliability savings for transit riders. And I think um, when we start to look at long-term goals like uh, environmental goals and climate change goals, getting people onto transit, walking and biking is a critical need and uh, goal of the city and projects like King Street help to get us there. So this, the decision with King Street was largely, as we've heard, this was the busiest service transit route in North America. How, what would the steps for transportation services and our staff here be in identifying other viable sites in the city for a program or a pilot like this? So through the speaker work now, through the partnership that we've built with our uh, colleagues at the TTC, are starting to look uh, through a surface transit plan and also a five-year service plan at what other corridors we can look at to make uh, similar style investments. Um, and whether it's um, transit signal priority or far side stops or some yeah, of the I, other I'm tools sorry, that we've I'm tested. sorry, I have to put your time on hold. It's very noisy in the council chambers. Please. That, that we Please. Just one sec, please. Okay, thank you. So that we could implement similar improvements in other locations. Of course, they're all quite site-specific, but um, one of the reasons why we collected as much data as we did was because we really wanted to test in live time a lot of these improvements to see how they would work so that we could replicate them. So I, I really appreciate how much uh, time and effort has been put into the data collection side of this. Uh, are those tools, if, is it cameras, is it, uh, what, what exactly are the technology that we've been using to collect that data and are we going to still have that data collection going forward? So we have leveraged uh, those, that technology. We have uh, purchased it as part of the pilot project. We will have it. We can move it to other locations if we choose to, which will really be beneficial when we want to look at another project for a project similar to King Street, that we have the volume collectors that are video-based, that we have Bluetooth readers. We have a lot of technology that was critical in allowing us to be able to um, measure the success and performance of this project. We will be able to leverage that, yes. So we've made that investment. We will be able to continually monitor King, but also deploy those resources elsewhere uh, if there is a, a need. That's correct. Okay. Um, do we have any data on how the pilot has impacted the trips uh, for wheel trans vehicles along the corridor? Like more, less, any information on that? Through the speaker, um, the number of wheel trans pickup and drop offs per day on the King Street corridor has remained at 30. Um, and this is despite uh, putting in all low floor streetcar accessible service on the King Street corridor during the period of the pilot. So it's been consistent both before and after the installation of the pilot program? Through the speaker, that's correct. Okay. And how have we specifically addressed the accessibility uh, component across the pilot? 
Uh, from a transit perspective, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we accelerated the deployment of low floor streetcars on the 504 route. Um, and this is coupled with accessibility improvements at the uh, far side streetcar stops where we installed uh, larger waiting areas and accessible ramps. Did you consult with uh, groups like TCAT, uh, different organizations, stakeholders that would be interested in ensuring that there was uh, accessibility components built into the pilot? Uh, through the speaker from, uh, again, from a transit perspective, I'll let Jacqueline speak from uh, everything else. Uh, we did put in accessible loading zones throughout the pilot area, and this was done in consultation with our customers and through um, our ACAT committee uh, through all the accessible uh, components of the SOPS. As well, city staff had accessibility advocates attend several conference calls hosted by Transportation Services both before and during the pilot project um, and they provided feedback on the way that accessibility was incorporated and improved in the pilot area. So have we been able to address the concerns raised by ACAT and other stakeholders uh, regarding accessibility along the corridor? Yes we have except for those raised by the taxi industry itself. Would there be We've heard a lot about the success of the pilot and the numbers and the consistency of the performance from a transit perspective. Mm -hmm. Would there be challenges or risks if we extended exemptions beyond what we have today? Uh, yes, Councillor. We're very concerned that any change to the exemptions would, um, would erode the improvements to transit performance that have been achieved through the pilot um, because of lack of compliance from, from those vehicles. Thanks Thank very you. much. Councillor Layton. Um, because I'd like to talk about lack of compliance uh, to, the, to the pilot. I'm curious um, if we have any metrics around that, uh, around compliance of the existing rules and what we've done about it. Through the speaker, when taxis are permitted to go through after 10 p.m., the rate of violations for general traffic is three times higher, resulting in about 30 percent of general traffic disobeying the, the um, posted restrictions after the 10 p.m. period. It kind of like a monkey see, monkey do. Someone goes straight through, the person behind them, taxi or not, can say, well, I can just go through as well. Based on staff observations, we've found that it, it appears more violations happen when they're following taxis through the, um, the posted restrictions. And what are we doing about uh, 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 for enforcement? Who's uh, enforcing? What, what are they using to enforce? In terms of enforcement, the Toronto Police are responsible for enforcing. They have um, both done regular enforcement as well as blitzes on various occasions. We've had close to 10,000 ticketed violations take place um, during that time period. We would um, recommend that um, additional blitzes take place going forward, that improvements to compliance can be achieved through LED blank out signs to more clearly indicate what those restrictions are, particularly at different times of day. Um, and uh, as well, we would in the future look to use automated enforcement methods once those are available to us. From the province. So the province still needs to grant that. That's uh, essentially a speeding kind of camera. Correct. Right, somewhere between a red light and a speeding camera. Through you, it is, and right now we're looking to get that enforcement capacity in uh, community safety zones focused on schools. That's what council has directed us to do. So can, can we talk about what lessons we've learned and, and how we're taking them and moving them forward in our surface transit routes? Uh, through you, absolutely. We've uh, created a very strong partnership with uh, our TTC colleagues in able to be uh, collect data, share data, um, be able to identify uh, on a relatively frequent basis uh, improvements, make tweaks to situations that need to uh, be improved, such as adding transit signal priority. We didn't start the pilot with transit signal priority. We were really able, in working together, to be able to test those things and see what actually had a meaningful impact in relatively real time. And so this uh, protocol that we use for King Street, parts of it, all of it, depending on locations, are things that we can certainly use in the future to be able to test how things are working. Um, and I think that that has helped to lead to improvements over time uh, in, the, in the pilot. What, what's the surface transit network plan? The surface transit network plan will be a companion to a five-year service plan. And I'll, I'll let Kathleen talk a little bit about the five-year service plan. But effectively, we want to look at, we have a surface transit plan in our official plan of the city, and there's not an operational uh, component to that. So we really want to start to look at how we would invest in other corridors so that we can increase transit speed and reliability, where we have the most opportunity to do that 
quickly uh, and cost effectively. So, so let me paraphrase that. We've seen such great success in the King Street corridor that we're now saying, hey, what lessons could we learn from this and put into effect elsewhere to speed up transit, get more people uh, either out of their cars or, or on transit or people that are taking another means? Uh, Absolutely, and engage community to do that. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, questions? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, through you to uh, staff. Um, uh, the questions uh, by my um, colleagues, uh, four or five of them that have asked, primarily around the improvements and the benefits to riders and ridership and so on. I wonder if uh, someone can help me to understand. We know that there is an impact on some businesses on King Street with respect to the pilot. Would that be correct to, to, to make that statement? Through the speaker, that's correct. We have seen um, a change in the year-over-year -year growth on total customer spending on King Street. Uh, before the pilot, it was 2.5% growth. After the pilot, it decreased slightly to 1.7% growth overall industries. And, and so those numbers, t tell me then in terms of the actual impact on businesses. Uh, how many businesses have, uh, for example, closed? Uh, now, I understand closing a business could be related to the um, to the pilot, and maybe it's not. And I don't know if you have the number, for example, of number of businesses that would be, in general, would be closed in the city of Toronto, let's say, the month of January and so on. Would you have those numbers? Through the speaker, I can reference the business license cancellation rates that are collected by our municipal licensing service. So we compared the King Street pilot area cancellation rates for businesses to the surrounding area and citywide. The King Street transit pilot area consistently had a lower cancellation rate, um, although it did increase um, from 8.9% cancellations in 2016 um, to 11.1% cancellations in, in 2018. The surrounding area um, was in the range of 17 to 13% in those years, and the citywide was generally at about 13% cancellations. So again, it's always lower than the surrounding area and citywide. Um, I would note also that there are several active development sites on King Street which have resulted in the closure of businesses because of those, those sites being reconstructed. Okay. So um, have we engaged a research company, for example, to look at um, the um, response from the public in terms of those who are writing the, uh, the, the, the transit system as a result of the pilot because we've talked about the increase in terms of ridership and how those individuals are utilizing or uh, frequenting the businesses on King Street. Um, is that something that we've actually done in order to be able to garner and gather that type of information? Through the speaker, we, we did have some metrics, as we discussed earlier, with the customer spending data from Moneris, uh, the largest point of sale provider um, in the country. Um, we also looked at um, some surveys of the way that people use public space, and we found that uh, the three of the new curb lane cafes attracted about 30% of all use in public spaces. So we know that those cafes that businesses invested in with us to animate the street um, were well used by patrons. Okay. So I, I wonder if I could, through you, Speaker, it's a question for Mr. Williams, General Manager for <coughs> Economic Development. Mr. Williams, can you tell me what are the plans to figure out ways that we could, not only we, we talk a little bit about animation, but to figure out ways that we could actually help businesses ongoing to improve the, uh, you know, the opportunities of people going and visiting and frequenting these businesses because we've heard from them that there's been some impact with respect to the business uh, losses. So it's clear from the deputations that some businesses, especially some restaurants, have lost business during uh, the pilot period. Um, we've worked with the local uh, BIA, the Entertainment District BIA, to help uh, increase the uh, um, uh, visibility and positive attitude towards uh, the uh, businesses in that area to increase uh, patronage and uh, help cars and or sorry help patrons find and get to the restaurant uh, those of us who've done that have figured out a way to get close by car so it's helping all the patrons to do that 
Uh, we've also used ritual and an incentive plan to speed that process up in the past. Uh, staff have already talked about the uh, public domain improvements that can become permanent. So, Increasing the patio space also is important. So if the decision here today is to make this permanent, there's going to be ongoing activity and work to try to increase the traffic and to um, obviously encourage more people to participate and visit the businesses on King Street. This is an effort that you're an undertaking you're going to be making as part of this process? Customer traffic, yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning. I'd like to begin with uh, some questions of planning staff. So King Street uh, is one of a number of streets that are identified in the official plan as uh, being good candidates for increased transit priority. Is that correct? Through the Speaker, yes, Map 5 of the official plan identifies the surface transit network. Uh, and as the General Manager has talked about, we've got some work underway looking at, at ways to uh, improve or augment service on, on those routes. So that, that map, Map 5, which uh, was passed as part of the plan, has been around since 2003, six somewhere in there, yeah? Through the Speaker, that's correct. Yeah, and uh, actually we're currently going out with some consultation to update it. Through the Speaker, yes, we have uh, some consultations underway right now, looking at some, uh, some uh, amendments or improvements to the policies in the, the transportation sections of the official plan, including that map. And, but the general idea is uh, we, you know, through long-term work and analysis about uh, where transit is heavily used in the city and where we could do better, we already have in hand a proposed list of streets, which we from time to time update, that are very good candidates for the kind of cost-effective investment in transit that we've seen on, on King Street. Through the speaker, that's correct. And I, again, to, I guess to the general manager of transportation, this project you said has been uh, an unprecedented success. Through the speaker, that, that is my, uh, my opinion, yes, based on uh, looking at the outcomes for transit riders, for the public space, um, for the, the limited impact that it's had on surrounding travel, uh, as well as the attention I think that it's received from others who want to replicate it. So if we were looking for ways to, to replicate this kind of success of moving the most people for the least money and actually having a positive impact on the surrounding area, Map 5 would be a good place to look. Through the speaker, one of the reasons why we have this companion effort of looking at the five-year service plan for TTC as well as this surface transit network plan and the amount of data and the things that we tested as part of this pilot is so that we could move forward with the next set of corridors with a real operational plan to get that minimum investment and, and maximum capacity improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I have to take my uh, rose-colored glasses off to <laughs> ask a few. Councillor Parks. In all seriousness, though. Did you uh, have cataracts done? <laughs> now I can see much better. Uh, I did want to ask a few questions because it's not all good news in uh, the pilot project. All right, my friends. Um, I'm, I'm I did want to ask questions of TTC. Madam Speaker, we're uh, 30 seconds into it. I know. Um, I just want to talk about headway. One of, the, uh, one of the appendices talks about headway. If I've got that right, that's the gap between streetcars. Uh, from one to the, you don't want one that's too short, you don't want one that's too long. Too short means they're bunched together, too long means people are waiting with clenched fists for their streetcars. Was the headway better or worse through the project? I, I, uh, I took note of the charts in here and it appears to be worse. Through the speaker, um, a number of changes happened throughout the pilot uh, period um, that okay. are not related to the pilot, such as the conversion of streetcar service from our smaller uh, legacy fleet to larger low floor streetcars. And as part of the low floor conversion plan on all of our routes, the headways are meant to widen and that is not related to the pilot. All right, and so that's a good point. So through this project, was there a big change on the capacity of the streetcars? We went from the old uh, streetcar style to the, the low floor, the long streetcars. Is that correct? 
Mr. Speaker, that's correct. Um, prior to the beginning of the pilot, we were operating about 1,800 people in our uh, peak capacity in the AM, and now we're operating close to 2,900 people. And uh, as I spoke to earlier, that has been filled up by uh, demand. So there was some latent demand, so the, the larger streetcars got filled. Now, do those, those larger streetcars have more, more doors? Do they board fairly quickly? Through the speaker, uh, each of the low floor streetcars has four sets of doors. Okay. And were there other things going on throughout this project? There's something in here about side loading of cars, I guess. Uh, there was something in here about changes to signals and timing and schedule changes. Is it fair to say that people were at work uh, throughout this project making changes to the process around the movement of streetcars through this zone? Significant changes. Through the speaker, we were making tweaks uh, as we needed to to respond to the changing conditions, especially uh, the change in demand. Uh, that definitely had an impact on travel times and travel conditions, especially shifting from our legacy streetcars to our low floor streetcars. So allocation of run as directed streetcars to reduce gaps and mitigate service disruptions is a tweak. So you slip an extra car in there. Through the speaker, uh, that was done at the beginning of the pilot and not towards the end, but that is uh, a strategy that's used operationally, including on our subway routes and bus routes. Understood. So uh, the numbers were that, that before the pilot, it was 72,000. What month was that measured in? Through the speaker, that was measured at the beginning of September of 2017. Beginning of September 2017. The pilot started in November 12th, if I'm correct. Through the speaker, that's correct. So what was the measurement in October? Uh, through the speaker, um, our counting, uh, our ridership counts are done on a more periodic basis, but our October 2018 count was also consistent at 84,000. 84,000. That was, and what day was that taken in October? Uh, that was done on a number of days. Uh, it's a sample of days on the second week of October of 2018. Okay, and what's the sample mean? You, you. Uh, through the speaker, our counting was done through uh, people at on-street stops throughout the pilot area. Okay, and, and the ridership kind of went up and went down. So it, it, went, it went down from 84,000, went down to 80,000 and 81,000, and it went back up to 84,000. If I got that right, so it's kind of variable. Mr. Speaker, that's correct. That's consistent with the seasonal variability we see on across the network. So in October, the count was 84,000. Through the speaker, um, the, the first count starting after the pilot started was 84,000. No, no, you said in October. In October of 2018, it was 84,000. What was it in October 2017? Uh, through the speaker, we did not do a count in October 2017. Oh, so we didn't check the month before. Uh, through the speaker, uh, that's consistent with how we count on all of our streetcar routes, which is, does not ha which is currently manual counting. Okay, so we, we just don't know from September to through October to the start of the pilot, which started mid-month, suddenly in November it was 84,000. Okay. Um, I wondered, uh, we talked a little bit about the low floor streetcars, um, headway. Um, just in terms of performance, was everything positive? Did we have some days when uh, the average was actually less than before the pilot or the performance was less? Through the speaker, um, we had variability in travel time and performance to the whole pilot, and this could be attributed to a number of different things, including the uh, unprecedented increase in ridership, uh, as well as the conversion of streetcars from our legacy to our low floor fleet. Of course, weather and other instances along the route will continue to impact uh, but, service on but the But I read the tables right. I mean, there were some statistics, and throughout the project where it was reported, there was a negative impact, even in the absence of the major amount of motor vehicles on. King, there were still uh, there were still days when it was worse than before the pilot. Through the speaker, uh, the King reason. streetcar continues to be uh, affected by mixed traffic operation outside of the pilot zone. Okay. So there are instances that happen outside the pilot area that may impact the pilot. And the last last question: uh, How many stops are there in the, on the entire route, and how many stops are in the pilot zone, and does that capture all 84,000 people? Are all 84,000 people moving through this pilot zone? Okay. Through the pilot, um, we have 10 stops within the pilot, compared to about 65 in the uh, entire. Now, that was your last question. And, Councillor Holliday, just so you know, I reset your timer earlier when you lost your 30 seconds. Councillor Cressy to speak. Uh, well, th thank you, Speaker. Um, I th this has been a long road. In fact, it's been about three and a half years. And I think we should begin by, and I would begin by thanking our staff in transportation services, in TTC, and in city planning. This has been a joint effort and led jointly by all three of them, and real credit goes to their leadership. Uh, to the mayor, uh,
for leading on this. Um, and also to former councillor uh, and Deputy Mayor Pam McConnell. When this started, it was in our two wards, and her very last executive committee meeting was on this topic. In fact, we passed the, to approve the pilot the day before she passed away. And so for decades, long before I arrived here, uh, people have called for improvements, transit improvements to King Street. Um, in three and a half years, and with just 17 months of the installation of a pilot, we have demonstrated by nearly every measure that this has been an overwhelming success. Unprecedented, as our staff have said. In fact, cities around the world are now looking to us for other investments in transit that can make a huge difference. Was it perfect? I mean, as the local councillor dealing with every little issue, I can tell you, of course it wasn't perfect. It's a pilot. You know, we, we changed some signals, we put down some paint, we, we put up some signs. It's a pilot for a reason. It's not designed to be perfect. That's what happens when you make it permanent. And so the time has come to do just that, to make the King Street pilot and to make it better. That's the opportunity here. We've heard the history is that this is the largest surface level transit route in all of North America. In the entire city, only Line 1 and Line 2 of the subway carry more people than the King Streetcar. And we increased from 72,000 daily riders to 84,000 people in just a month. 84,000. We should be aiming for 100,000. And those riders are now moving a faster and more reliable streetcar. And so this experiment, this little big experiment in city building, has demonstrated that when you take bold action and you take a big leap, you can make this city work better. And so we have, finally, a streetcar that's moving more people, faster and more reliable. I can tell you, for the first time in my life, living downtown and working downtown, I go out of my way to ride the King Streetcar. And we've even noted, and this is what's so important as it relates to mode shift, we even noted that since the installation of the King Pilot, an overall increase in the number of people traveling in and out of the core, a 3% increase in the number of people traveling in and out of the core, but a decrease of 7% of the number of people driving. In a growing city, which is adding a million people into the city in the next 20 years, that's what success looks like, moving people out of cars and into active transportation. And so why did we do this? We did this to move people. If we don't move people in and out of the core quickly, we will fall by the weight of our success. And this pilot overwhelmingly has demonstrated that we are moving more people. And we also did this to fuel the economy. One third of all jobs in the entire city, 500,000 of them are located in the core. The core produces one quarter of the city's tax base. It generates 51% of the city's GDP. All of your residents, in this chamber, many of them work in the core, but they can't get to and from work because the roads are congested. And so that's why you have to redesign our streets to move people rather than move cars that are stuck in traffic. A city that can't move people simply can't succeed. And so our path moving forward now is today, of course, to make it permanent, but to make it better. For transit riders to increase capacity and improve with automated enforcement, for businesses, I will say, that success was felt by some, but not by all. And to that, I, I will say, as the local councillor, that we hear you, and our commitment is to transform, transform King into a true 21st century destination street with permanent patios, enhanced street lighting, and improved public realm. And in 2023, when track replacement comes, we have an opportunity then to do something really special on King. Uh, I'll conclude by once again thanking our staff and the mayor, and, and I'll note the mayor in particular for his unwavering leadership on this. Change is hard. It's always hard. On King, change was not only necessary, but it worked. And as Brad Ross likes to say, King is King again. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Holliday to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I have two motions, if I may ask. Uh, that they be presented. 
on the screen. The first is, is to accept what is described as the compromise solution by some of the business owners, and that is to allow through traffic in the overnight hours after 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. the next morning and on weekends. And the second motion, um, a little different, is uh, to exempt green or electric vehicles along the King Street pilot zone. And we'll talk about those in a second. So I, I put on my rose-colored glasses, and I know they're a little silly, but I, um, I, I do mean to be symbolic in this, and I really Elton think that councillors need to take off their rose-colored glasses just once in a while and uh, filter out the fanfare. Not everything is always positive. The report itself admits that in the morning rush, there wasn't a lot of time savings, if any at all, and that there was some in the afternoon peak period. The thing that surprised me the most was by removing the vehicles, the predominant number of vehicles on this stretch of King, we actually didn't do better. Actually didn't do even better than what we did. And so I'm a little dubious about, you know, how great all these things are. And if you look deeper into the details here, you find out the headways aren't as good as what they were. You find out that not every instance resulted in a time saving. We don't know exactly what the ridership was just before the pilot started. It skipped a month. We know that ridership is cyclical through the year. I don't know if they did the September count on Frosh Week when you know students were elsewhere or other things were going on. I don't know how the integration of uh, low floor streetcars and adjustments to schedule improved or hindered this project. I don't know what the two hour transfer did towards the end of it. Is ridership all up all around? There is some allusion to that in the report. So the lesson learned here is I'm not convinced that it is as magical as what it is. And the thing that really scares me is the section in here that talks about this is a framework for change in other places. And I remember when this vote first went through on the council floor, what I heard from my colleagues all around me was, that's a good start. I can't wait to do it in other places. I'm not sure that that's the best thing. Uh, what I was really clear about was what I heard on the campaign trail during the last election. Not everybody in the city thinks this is a great idea. And uh, so, you know, is there a chance to make some improvements for transit? I'm a transit user myself. I've been down there to ride King Street. I've been down there to walk on King Street. I've had a good look at this over time. Uh, maybe there is some improvements during the day that we could do with some of these changes. But what I also heard loud and clear was a number of businesses that uh, told me they were upset about this and that their prosperity was down. I heard constituents out in the West End saying, you know, it's things like King Street that make me want to not choose to come down to that district. And, you know, there may not be science behind why they do that, but it's their approach to accessing the inner city. And I don't think that's healthy. So could a compromise perhaps make things better? I wonder. Would a compromise not harm transit? I don't see how it could. If the issues that we're experiencing are during the afternoon peak, providing people some relief in the evening hours and on the weekends, I cannot see a downside to that. The last piece I'll just mention, and it was a thought I had a while back, was just this idea of electric vehicles. You know, on the same day that we approved the beginning of the King Street Pilot at Council, we also approved the Transform TO plan. And what happened since then? We had this great thought that uh, electric vehicles would be a great changer in that plan. It's, it's written in that, that colorful waterfall that was uh, in the plan about how we're going to achieve carbon reduction. One of the things that happened was there were some cancellations in the incentives of electric vehicles. So that got me thinking, you know, what can we do as a city to encourage the advent of the electric vehicle? You know, how can we do that cost effectively? It would cost us almost nothing to allow electric vehicles to use this corridor, perhaps as a premium. Maybe some people will choose that type of technology, notwithstanding the costs that are, that are given to them, and recognize this as maybe a little premium thing that the City of Toronto can do. I'm not sure it would really change things a lot. It is a street with cars on it today, something that the report admits that, you know, there is right turn cars that go through. It's not like they've totally disappeared. Uh, so a few extra here or there I don't think are going to make a big difference. They, they have a GV plate. We all know what those cars are. They're, they're quite evident as they go by. So I'm not really sure it's a very difficult thing to enforce. Uh, so there you have those motions. I think they're quite reasonable in nature. I think they achieve all the objectives of trying to improve the situation on King Street and provide some relief to some others that have been suffering throughout this. We've heard from them and we see evidence in this report about it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks to speak. 
Thank you, Speaker. I, I think it's actually very important to pause and reflect on the fact that we have two major transit reports in front of us today. This one and one dealing with uh, whatever it is is going on at the province. A thing always worth keeping in mind uh, when dealing with transit is there's never enough money. Never enough money. You want to be able to run more buses, you want to be able to run more streetcars, more subways. You'd love it if it was free, but there's never enough money. So our job when looking at this report and the report that we'll get to sometime in this council meeting is to ask ourselves what moves the most people for the least money. And as you heard very clearly from the, the staff over there, this is without a doubt the single biggest success we have had in an extraordinarily long period of time here in the City of Toronto. It's worth also noting that it came from it came from an analysis that our staff did about how to move the most people for the least money and where the bottlenecks in the system lay. It came from work that goes back, frankly, uh, two decades where staff have been saying to us, and I can remember a previous uh, proposal uh, to give transit priority on King Street uh, when Mel Lastman was mayor. City staff have been telling us for a long time, you have a limited amount of money and you have to choose to make the investments that give the biggest return. It's the kind of principle I know that our budget chief uh, keeps close to his heart every time that we consider our annual budget. It's the true efficiency. <coughs> if anyone ever tells you that they want more efficiency at the municipal level of government, you say, you're exactly right, we should do more things like the King Street pilot and fewer things like drawing great big maps with pencil crayons and putting them forward as transit plans. That's what the evidence tells us. That's why I'm delighted to hear not only that we've been successful and that that, that logic has been borne out with evidence and success. And that's why I'm also delighted to hear that there's a discussion going on between planning, the TTC, and our transportation staff looking for ways to replicate that success. It's the way we should move forward with all of our transit thinking. We shouldn't be asking ourselves who deserves transit, but we should instead be asking ourselves who needs transit and how do we deliver it with the limited amount of money we have. That's what we should do as a government. And we should direct our staff to provide us that advice. I was at the executive committee when this and the other report were, were asked for, and I said, so of the various transit proposals that you've put in front of us this month, which ones are you putting forward based on the evidence that you have, and which ones are you putting forward based on things council told you to do irrespective of the evidence? This plan was put forward, the downtown relief plan was put forward, and the expansion of the Bloor Young uh, capacity at that interchange was put forward based on what the evidence and analysis told us was worth doing. All the rest of it, including the amendment that Councillor Holliday has put forward, does not come from evidence. It does not come from analysis that's been done by our staff and it will not be efficient. In fact, if we don't take what they're putting here in front of us seriously and instead do other things, we are deliberately wasting money. We are deliberately choosing to take a limited amount of money and spend it inefficiently and get less done and get <coughs> fewer people riding transit. So I encourage all of you, don't, don't vote for the amendments, vote for this and be mindful of the foundation of the success of this project when we get to the later item. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradford to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, through the chair, I'd like to uh, just start by recognizing all the work uh, that staff have put into this across 
all of the divisions here. Um, doing a pilot is not easy. That's, it, they're not easy for politicians. They're not easy for staff. Uh, there's a lot of deep consultation that goes into that. A uh, ton of monitoring, a ton of data, evidence, and work. Uh, so we know that's a, uh, you know, not necessarily the most straightforward or easiest approach, but I think it gets us to good outcomes. And I think that's what's really important and what we have in front of us here today. Uh, this project shows that you know, we can have a strong vision for transit. We can have a strong vision for our main streets here uh, in Toronto, but recognizing that it's important to bring people, bring residents, bring businesses along through the process, consult deeply, and rely on the evidence that's in front of us when we make those decisions. Um, as you heard through my questions, I'm really hoping that we can learn from this process uh, and look for other opportunities to be more efficient uh, with our transit dollars uh, here in Toronto. Um, this, from my perspective, is a smart policy. Uh, this is an efficient use of our resources, and it's about recognizing that we have unique transit challenges in this city. Uh, surface surface streetcars uh, going down the middle of some of our, our main streets presents challenges. And so what we have is a, a made in Toronto solution that, uh, that is really focused on how we most, move the most people most effectively. I think, you know, what's impressive here is for a relatively modest investment, of 1.5 million, we can make such significant improvements to transit, but also to the road safety. Um, when we went through the report, you saw that uh, people using King Street now felt safer, and that was 56% of transit users, 54% of pedestrians, 68% uh, of cyclists all reported feeling safer on King Street during the pilot. I think that's a win too. Uh, we definitely know that we need to make our streets safer in Toronto. Uh, we need to have these sort of specific interventions that also facilitate moving people, uh, moving transit, um, but creating safer main streets for everybody. So I, I'm pleased to support this project. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mayor Tory for his leadership on this, Councillor Cressy, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, I know it hasn't been easy, but I'm very pleased with uh, where we landed and uh, happy to see the King Street pilot permanent. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Karagiannis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do have a motion. If it can be put up, I'll greatly appreciate it. Uh, Madam Speaker, we do have two standards um, for looking after people with disabilities. One standard, if you're a Toronto Transit Commission wheel trans, you're able to go right through, not a problem. If, however, you are, um, when you put the call in to get uh, a, a mobility, somebody to come over and take you around, and if, if that's a uh, partner, uh, be a cabbie, uh, you're not able to go right through. So in order to make that field a level playing field, in, uh, in TDC Transit, we voted uh, that uh, the um, other vehicles be allowed. I'm putting the same motion here. This is not a motion that asks for anything um, uh, major. It's a few vehicles that, that go through and I'm looking for uh, that to be approved uh, by all, and I hope that the mayor does support it. This is answering the uh, calls of the people that uh, sometimes will get on a wheel trans, uh, a transit commission bus, and sometimes they won't, but they will go through one of the partners. They don't have a choice as to who picks them up. We make the decision where this is done, and we should also make sure that we make the decision that these people are treated equally. Madam Chair, I, um, I will have to admit that I was leery of the King Street project. I am still leery of it. And uh, when I speak to constituents, uh, they're giving me um, such things as uh, we can't get down to the theaters, poor restaurants are, um, are suffering. And in, when you're talking to the businesses people on King Street, they're adjusting, but it's taken a long time to adjust and they've lost a major amount of businesses. So uh, this is something that it's a unique situation. And when I hear people uh, we can take a look to doing this elsewhere as I'm, I'm sort of looking at it and I'm dreading and I'm going, which is the next street? Is it going to be Bayview, my good friend, or is it going to be Avenue Road that we're going to like to do that? And those streets are certainly, if we do that on them, they're going to be hurting the businesses. I mean, there's enough closed stores in the city of Toronto that we don't need to add anymore. However, Madam Speaker, I'm going to go back to the motion that I have uh, said and I request uh, all colleagues to support this in order to have a level playing field between TTC uh, Commission wheel trans and uh, partners that actually do the same work. Thank you. Councillor, oh, Councillor Matlow, you have a question for clarification? Yeah. Um, given that unlike most other TTC vehicles, wheel trans 
is point-to-point -point service. So it doesn't need to actually go <laughs> through many intersections through King. It can actually just go to the specific location on King, which they can access under the current uh, plan. What is the point of your motion? My point is my motion is that we heard from TPC clearly that they're allowed to go right through in order to go point to point. And the only thing that I'm asking for is that the partners that we have that do the same work that TTC Wheeltrans is doing be treated the same. My point is though that if uh, you, have, you have Wheeltrans in your motion, if it's point to point service, why do we need to change anything if they're no, already getting to the location? Right, Wheeltrans is the, these are the Wheeltrans buses, but the people operating on behalf of Wheeltrans, their partners, be at the uh, TTC, uh, sorry, be at the cab companies that have actually got contracts, they also be treated the same. So if they can already go to point to point service, if they're providing the same kind of service, why do they need to run straight through King? I just don't understand the logic of your motion. The Wheeltrans are able to go through while they're not. This was clearly but answered. They can still, but they can still go to the location. My point is, Councillor, that they be treated the same. The same service should be uh, afforded to somebody okay. that's, uh, which is on a wheel trans right. bus, no, I, I hear, I and the same point should be somebody that we send a taxi I, I cab hear, over. I hear what you're saying, but you, do you understand, though, that King Street is not restricted to those vehicles, it's just about going, going like, continuing King through. Street does not allow those vehicles, the cabs, to go through. And the only thing that I'm saying... Yeah, but they can go to the location. The, okay. Nobody disagreeing. However, the same service that I get on a wheel trans, the same service should be given to somebody that's on a cab. Okay. Unless we want to treat... I, I, I understand. So we should be treating everybody yeah. the same. Thank you, thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, I'd like to as well thank staff for their, their hard work uh, on this. This was a bold step. This was a bold move. Uh, I remember um, I, I had the, uh, the, the great privilege of representing part of the ward uh, or, or part of a, a ward that was part of the, the pilot project, uh, not with the more um, significant uh, interventions by, uh, uh, by the pilot, uh, but certainly a population that I was affected by the pilot. And I've been, uh, I have been canvassing uh, TTC stops along King uh, since 2008. So I was involved in elections before then from 2010 on for myself. Uh, and I know uh, every single transit rider had an issue with what was going on about how we could move people faster along that line. And as that community grew, the problem only got worse and worse and worse. And then I went down after the King Street pilot was put in. And you know, it's true, not everyone was 100% convinced. But most of the reasons why they weren't was because of conversations with this, that, and the other person uh, uh, about, the, about the potential impacts and that there wasn't ex actually uh, any, any benefit. But when you look at the data that was produced by the pilot, it is irrefutable. This is why I'm actually slightly surprised to hear from my colleague, Councillor Holliday, uh, that, that, that he doesn't see that. And that, in fact, he, he, he thought that it wasn't enough when our staff clearly said it was unprecedented, the, the impact and the improvement that, that was made. So, so maybe my, 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 my dear Councillor colleague, Councillor Holliday, can have his per prescription checked, because obviously, <laughs> He's not reading the report. Maybe he also needs to get his, uh, his hearing checked because perhaps he didn't hear the answers from staff when they said it was unprecedented, <laughs> the benefit that this, uh, that, that this pilot has had. A 16% increase overnight on a transit line, 16%. And the months after then, I went down and actually spoke to the residents that were, uh, that, that were transit riders on, on the King Street car. And more often than not, they were enormously supportive. Things like life-changing. This was a game-changer in their day. And I know it, like if people are gonna say, it's just a couple of minutes, it's 120 seconds. Add, those, add that time up to your day. And the number of people that are actually benefiting from that is enormous. This is a major change. And we should be proud of the direction that council took. But we should also be very cautious very cautious 
about any changes that are proposed here today. I'm surprised to hear these changes from uh, 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 Councillor Holliday, who, who generally speaking takes great care in reading the reports and following the evidence. I'm perhaps not as surprised to, to hear uh, or see the, the motion proposed by Councillor Karagiannis, and I won't be supporting that either. Um, they have different approaches in, in, their, in their work in this chamber. Uh, but, but what we heard from staff was at times when, when cabs were allowed through, violations were three times more likely. So let's not put this whole project at risk by increasing the number of, of violations by enormous amounts just to appease uh, the very few because people can still get to their destinations. They're still able to navigate around the downtown core. In fact, they're able to do so more efficiently now that our transit vehicles are moving better through the downtown core. Finally, uh, while I was the neighboring councillor west of Bathurst, uh, there, weren't many, there weren't many significant interventions west of Bathurst just because of the way the roads work with Richmond Adelaide uh, as, as go through streets. It wasn't possible to do some of the same things uh, west. Um, but I know that Councillor Cressley and Councillor McConnell were, were under enormous pressure by, their, by, by some in their communities uh, to take a different course. A and I'd like to thank them for showing their, uh, their bravery uh, and their sticking to their conviction about helping the now 80,000 people that ride on a regular basis because the city's better off now than it was before. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I would also rise to, um, to give my thanks to uh, staff who've been working on this particular uh, implementation. I think that it's, uh, it represents to me the very best of the city when we work together, the divisions coming together, uh, TTC, transportation services, and city planning, and, uh, and, and then seeing the outcome uh, manifest itself as quickly as it has, has just been inspiring. Um, I also would like to thank uh, previous councillors uh, Vaughn and McConnell. I know that they've been big champions of the transit corridor along King Street for some time. Um, our former chief planner uh, for, uh, for I, I think, initiating the, the conversation. Uh, Councillor Cressy, who's, uh, who's done a yeoman's amount of work on, on the pilot, um, and, uh, and Mayor Tory, as well as the executive committee, um, who voted unanimously to support the, 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 the making of King Street uh, pilot permanent. Um, and it's actually quite telling when you actually have um, really good outcomes um, with thoughtful, careful planning um, and how it's implemented and, and where people can go with it. And I think that given the, given the intervention that's been made uh, and the, the modest amount of money, uh, we have seen some very big changes. Uh, the King Street pilot tr uh, transit benefits are numerous, uh, faster, more predictable travel times, more people taking transit along King Street, ridership going up by 16% from 72,000 to 84,000 boardings per day, uh, greater customer satisfaction um, along King Street and with the operation of the streetcar, uh, improved efficiency, reliability, uh, streetcar operations, and with 25% more customers uh, per hour per service. Uh, by all accounts, that is a big success. Other tangible benefits, I think, um, that we don't necessarily talk about um, is the fact that we had to make a move. The, the downtown is changing and how we need to get people to and from work, uh, to and from their places of, uh, of study and worship and home have to change. And we could not let King Street, um, and, and, uh, and in particular King Street, with given the volume of people who need to get to where they need to go, we could not let King Street stand um, in, in sort of uh, situ without any significant changes. And, and that's a big, big dramatic improvement. The 2016 census reports uh, uh, says that along the 500 meters of King Street Pilot, there's, there's approximately 230 jobs. That's 230 jobs all along the King Pilot Corridor from 500 meters from that, uh, from that project and approximately 30,000 residents. When we're talking about economic prosperity and getting people to work on time, as, as we're talking about efficiencies and productivity, those numbers cannot be ignored. 
And for that reason, I have some letters of support, and we should all note that this project is supported by the Financial District BIA, who represents the biggest employer in, in the country. Uh, they have a lot of people needing to get uh, to their office towers to get to where they need to go, uh, and they have found this project uh, to be highly successful uh, for those workers. The other thing, and my final point, is that this 2.6 kilometers of, of, tr uh, of surface transit corridor has been widely studied. Um, there has, there's not too many other projects that have gone through this level of scrutiny and probably this, uh, this amount of attention than the King Street pilot project. And I think that if we are going to be making evidence-based uh, decisions uh, founded on good data and data collection, which was central to how staff have written their report, I think that we would have to uh, support this pro project and make it as permanent as possible. They collected the data, they monitored, they evaluated, the recommendations are before us. I think we should adopt it without any um, amendments. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> the last speaker will be <laughs> Councillor Peruzza. I got a motion. Um, speaker, I have a motion. Um, uh, perhaps it can be put on the uh, on the board. Uh, speaker, whenever we talk about mobility or moving in the city of Toronto, I, I just I was just adding up here. Uh, for example, I live in the northwest uh, part of the city of Toronto, and I work downtown. I'm not alone in this. I'm not the only person who lives in one of the suburbs and comes to work in the city of Toronto. So I, I take transit sometimes, and here's, how, here's what it takes me. So I get on Islington, I either go to Finch or Steeles, if I catch the bus right away and I don't have to wait for the bus, right, it's a six-minute bus ride to either Steeles or Finch. Then, if I catch the bus right away, it's a 35 to 45-minute bus ride to the subway station, either Finch Station or, or Black Creek. Then if I catch the subway right away, it's a 40 to 50-minute subway ride to downtown, and it's a three to four-minute walk from the subway station to here. It's 105 minutes. That's one hour and 45 minutes on transit. Welcome to my world, folks. I'm not the only person in this, that, that in that position. I live in the city of Toronto. I work downtown Toronto. That's what it takes me on transit. I get in my car an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 25 minutes, depending on traffic. I get on my bicycle, just a little over an hour, sometimes under an hour, depending. Quickest way for me to get here is like on my motorcycle. And I like it. Welcome to my world. But you know, hearing some of my downtown colleagues sometimes chat about this and transit is the, the solution to it all, yeah, I agree. Ain't going to make it much faster for me. An hour and 45 minutes. And by the way, that's an hour and 45 minutes back home because that's the, that's, that's the, that's the give of it on transit. Depending on what time I leave here, if, if I leave during a, an optimal time, uh, at night time, for example, when we used to sit at night, I can get home in, in about 40, 45 minutes in a car. But if I use transit, I'm still looking at just shy of two hours. Actually, probably a little more because the system runs a little slower then, and you're, and you're left sitting around uh, uh, waiting for buses. So what my motion asks, and what I've been asking for, uh, uh, from the get-go is, and I understand that motorcycle users and scooter users are a very, very small fraction of road users in general. So because it's such a small group, it never, it never factors into the debate. We never ever consider 
uh, um, I, you know, people who are using some mechanized uh, bicycle that occupies more or less the same amount of space on the road. A Vespa doesn't occupy much more space than an e-bike. E it doesn't. But because it's got a, a, a license plate on it, and an e-bike doesn't, they go the same speed because you're going light to light, and you're going in the flow of traffic. So it's not like the speed variables are any different. But you will allow the e-bike because it's considered a bicycle. But you won't allow the Vespa because it's got a license plate. That's bizarre. And we're just, we're really, we're talking about a handful of scooters and motorcycles. Nobody rides a motorcycle before May, and nobody rides it after the middle of October. Because your road conditions don't allow it. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with allowing an oversized bicycle Thank or you. a slightly bigger bicycle Thank on you. the street? Thank you, Councillor Peruzza. Thank you. Thank you. Last speaker, Mayor Tory. Uh, thanks, Madam Speaker. I, I have a motion, um, and it's a very simple little motion that I think members of council won't have trouble with, and it, it, it speaks to item uh, recommendation number seven. And right now, recommendation seven says that the, uh, we would request the general manager of transportation services to further monitor and assess the late night performance of the King Street Transit uh, Priority Corridor. And I would just rather like to take out the words late night and have them continuously look at a number of things, including some of the issues that we've heard about today with regard to people of differing abilities, including some of the concerns of business. Because we've said here in this chamber, and I certainly was going to reinforce in my own remarks, the fact that uh, we're going to continue to improve this. And I'd like to make sure that we have, using all the data that we will still continue to collect, uh, you know, have regular reports and that the general manager will feel quite, uh, not only feel free, but feel encouraged. Uh, to bring forward uh, observations and reports on the overall performance of this. If, for example, the transit performance starts to deteriorate for some reason, I think we'd want to know that because one of the reasons I'm certainly standing up to strongly advocate uh, in favor of the recommendations here in making this permanent is because it's working. And if it stops working, I think we'd want to know about that or if it starts to look like things are heading in the wrong direction as opposed to today when it's headed in the uh, right direction. Um, so beyond that motion, uh, Madam Speaker, what I certainly wanted to start by doing was to uh, was to pay tribute to staff, uh, past and present, uh, who have uh, worked on this. And I made mention at the Executive Committee, and I think it's uh, very deserving of being mentioned, that the staff, including the TTC and planning staff, did a lot of work before this pilot project even started. And uh, Jennifer Keysmat, for example, um, you know, led in the process of an incredibly big, and we forget these things because it was a while ago, uh, an incredibly robust consultation process that was undertaken that I think gave us um, some of the foundational information on which to try and maximize the chances for success, both uh, operationally but also with the public. I mean, I, I recall the meetings, I think, were held at Metro Hall and there were like hundreds of people there. This was not something where there were, you know, 43 people, not that that would be wrong either, but there were hundreds of people there and we gathered their input. Um, and then uh, the staff, that's the present staff, who were also, many of them were here at the time, uh, picked up on this and I think did a uh, an incredible job, uh, in particular the quanti quantity of the measurement that took place and all the data that we asked them to report to the public on. And I don't think there's ever been a project that had more publicly reported, frequently reported data so people could see as we went along um, how it was going. And the bottom line was that pretty well with the exception of, of obviously some challenges that exist for some of the businesses for a variety of reasons, the transit part of this was successful from day one and continued to be successful and grew on its own success as time uh, went on. But that was again thanks to a lot of hard work on the part of our staff and I thank them uh, very much for that. You know, there are people who are critical of this pilot project uh, means of going about bringing about change. I don't apologize for it. Not only do I not apologize for it, I think the times we've used it on issues that uh, showed some potential to be controversial and to, to not lend themselves to a consensus, it proved to be the right thing to do. Because what we did in the cases where we've done it, and this long preceded my time here, but certainly for me, I believe in it and I pay little attention to those who criticize it and say it's too slow or too timid or too this or too that. 
I believe our job, I certainly believe my job as the one person here that's elected across the city, is to draw a consensus. And I think what's happened as a result of the fact that we did the pilot project, we had a lot of data, we had consistent and frequent reporting, is that over time a consensus built across the city. Because I do not believe what we're doing here today is something that's just supported by people who live around King Street or otherwise. I think people across the city have come to understand, based on facts and measurements, this is the right thing to do in the broader public interest of moving people in the city of Toronto, of helping the environment by getting people out of their cars, of making things more, uh, more um, uh, putting things in a better way for people who live along that corridor and people who work along that corridor and people who visit. And so I think, again, that we've proven uh, that when we look at ways in which we can prove out these concepts, measure these concepts, and, and, uh, and, and uh, make improvements, that we can develop a better consensus and then have a decision we will take today, I believe, uh, almost if not unanimously, uh, that uh, I think will be much better for the city. And uh, I think there are people who uh, will say, and, and with some facts to back them up, that we haven't achieved perfection on this. Uh, perfection is very difficult to achieve, but I think what we have done is something that is, is, is very definitely in the broader public interest, for sure, is definitely in the better interest of moving people in the city, has been done on a cost-effective basis, and by making this small change that I've just advocated, and by the way, I will not support the other motions, I think all of those things could be the subject of some of the ongoing review done by the staff on this project, green vehicles, some of the challenges I talked to, and I, I thank very much um, uh, you know, our um, uh, Kathy Birch from, from the uh, Toronto Community Housing Accessibility Committee for coming today. I think the concerns that she just articulated to me, which had more to do with the ability of vehicles to stop on King Street than the ability, as Councillor Matlow brought out, to have people delivered to the same place, are things we should look at and our staff should look at. But I think that there's continuous fine tuning we can do to make this work better for everybody, and I hope that we will do that. But the bottom line for me, Speaker, it's working. It's working, the pilot project proved that, the data proved that, it's working in the broader interests of the public in Toronto, the traveling public and everybody else. We have some challenges to address with business and perhaps with people with differing abilities. We will address those, we will invest in this corridor in terms of transit, in terms of public realm and making this better for everybody and I look forward to doing that and I look forward to an overwhelming approval of this today because I think that would be good for the city. Thank you. Okay, so we'll vote. We're voting on the motions in numeric order. Our first motion is motion 1A. Recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. Okay, that's mine. That's mine. Motion 1A does not carry. The vote is 6 to 19. Motion 1B. Recorded vote. Motion 1B does not carry. The vote is 3 to 22. Mo motion 2. Recorded vote. Just be patient.
Councillor Karajanis, please. Councillor Fletcher. Motion two does not carry. The vote is seven to 18. Motion three. Recorded vote. Councillor Ainsley, please. Motion three does not carry. The vote is nine to 16. Motion four. Recorded vote. Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Karagiannis, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Karagiannis, your vote, please. Councillor Karagiannis, please. Councillor Karagiannis, your vote, please. Motion four carries unanimously, 25 in favor. Item as amended, recorded vote. The item as amended carries, the vote is 22 to three. Okay, <laughs> so members, um, our next item uh, would have been the mayor's second key item. Um, so uh, I've spoken to the mayor and the report is, uh, has not been circulated yet. So Mr. Mayor, did you want to make a comment? Madam Speaker, what I'd like to suggest is that we stand down uh, my second key item and I was going to suggest a time of say four o'clock this afternoon. Uh, we can proceed with other business. In the meantime, my understanding is the report is imminent, uh, uh, so that uh, that would give people several hours in which to read it, including over the lunch break, and then we could get that discussion started today. Because I think that's going to be a long discussion, as well it should be, and uh, I think it would be great if we could start it today. And uh, so I would propose that we stand it down until uh, 4 o'clock. Thank you. There's no debate, uh, Councillor Madden. I'm rising on a point of privilege. Yeah. Um, I, I submit that it is completely unreasonable for an item of this importance to have a report dropped on us and while we're in a meeting where we're supposed to be reviewing and addressing the issues that are at the meeting in front of us, be expected to also thoughtfully review and understand uh, the report that we're about to receive from the city manager on the very day that it's debated. So I ask, uh, 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 I'd, li I, I'd like to find some way, and I, I seek your advice or the clerk's advice, uh, to respectfully disagree with the advice of the mayor and have uh, this item uh, 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 considered tomorrow morning so that members of council can just simply have an opportunity to read and understand the report, and then we'll be ready to vote in the morning. Thank, thank you. Councillor Matlow, it's the mayor's key item, and the mayor would like to deal with the item at 4 o'clock, and that's what we'll deal with. So there's no debate. Councillor Matlow, you already had your point of order, point of privilege. No, Councillor Matlow, I'm sorry. You had your point of order and point of privilege. Let's move on with the agenda. That's my ruling. Our next item on the, on the agenda would be the uh, city's tenants first, but it's my understanding that Toronto Housing is not here to answer the questions, so we'll deal with that after lunch. So I'm suggesting that we go in camera to discuss the three items for the Civic Appointments Committee. So can I have a motion to go in camera? Mo uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Minnawong. On favor? Oh, hold on. You have to read it. Oh, 
Oh, sorry. Your mic. Yeah. Um, that council recess its public session to meet as committee of the whole in closed session to consider CA 5.4, appointment of public members to the exhibition place board, reason for confidential information, personal matters about identifiable individuals who are being considered for appointment to the exhibition place board, and CA 5.5, appointment of public members to the Toronto Zoo board, reason for confidential information, personnel matters about identifiable individuals who are being considered for appointment to the Toronto Zoo Board. Okay, on um, favor, carried. Okay, if I can ask everyone in the council, uh, council chambers to please vacate the chambers. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Uh, City Council has uh, completed its closed meeting consideration of items CA 5.4 and CA 5.5 regarding appointments to exhibition place in the Toronto Zoo. No motions were made in closed session. Members, Councillor Thompson uh, requested that he be present for the public debate on this item. So I'm suggesting that we, I propose that we have the public debate on this item after the lunch recess. Councillor Fillion, did you want to deal with yours? Uh, I can uh, release that. Thanks. Okay, so on page 4, CA 5.2, Councillor Fillion is releasing. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Matlow? Is Councillor Matlow, is he around or has he left the building? Okay, we're, well, not really. Well, no, because it was, Councillor Layton, yes? Thank you very much. I know that he, he, he's mentioned he has some questions on the item, so if there is a possibility of holding it down, I don't see why we wouldn't give him the same courtesy as we've just given Michael Thompson, Councillor Thompson. Okay. He didn't mention it to me, though. Yes. No, but I mean, yeah. Page 4, EC 3.5, City of Toronto Refugee Capacity Plan. Councillor Karagiannis, do you have questions to staff? Yes, Madam Chair. I do. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Through you to staff, um, can you please give us an update as to what is happening with, in conjunction with the federal government coming to the table regarding funding for, um, for refugee um, uh, settlements and what is happening with, in, versus the, uh, the money that we get from uh, the federal government regarding shelters? At this, uh, through the speaker at the staff level, we continue to have uh, regular discussions with uh, staff from IRCC. Uh, there has been no uh, commitment at the staff level with respect to funding at this point. Um, has the government of uh, Canada consulted with you on the fact of the omnibus bill changes that are coming through right now and uh, them moving not to be allowing refugees to, to save three countries? No, that was not, that has not been a topic of discussion. Have you calculated how is that going to help or hinder uh, our work with the refugees versus us being a, a city that's uh, open to everybody coming in? <clears throat> uh, through the speaker, uh, given that that is not within the city's jurisdiction, that is not an issue that we are tracking. Um, once there is clarity, uh, then we would look to understand either uh, the impact on uh, flows to Toronto, but with respect to the policy, that's not within our purview. Uh, have we given any consideration to having a staff person on a full-time basis that would look at and, and help you with decisions that we make regarding refugees and all the influx that we have had with the Syrians, the Haitians, and everybody else? Are you recommending that we do have a staff person full-time engaged in this? Through the have speaker, you we, consideration? we do have one position within the Toronto Newcomer Office. The uh, four positions in the office are funded by uh, IRCC. There is one position that is city funded, and that position addresses refugee issues. Um, what work are we able to do now since we um, had the original Syrian refugees? How did that mindset change now that we do have one person that's full, um, fully looking after it? I mean, what was the mindset that changed when I asked the same question back when the Syrians were coming in and I recommend that we have a, a person full time? What, that, what took place that actually changed, uh, changed staff mind or your mind? Through the speaker, that experience um, provided both uh, the city and the uh, non-governmental organizations uh, the opportunity to develop very good working relationships, very good knowledge 
of uh, the respective roles within the system. Um, that relationship building has continued as we've been dealing with the current flows. So that idea was not a bad idea? No, the, the demands with respect to um, refugee flows will continue to be of issue for the City of Toronto for what, the foreseeable future. What do you foresee our numbers been going uh, are they going to be going? They have they have have they flatlined, or are they going to be exponentially going ahead? Do we have a graph that will show us what are we we expect our numbers to be like? Um, at the moment, they are relatively stable. They continue at a high level. I don't have the the numbers immediately in front of me. There has been a change in that um, the number of irregular crossers has significantly declined. Uh, In-country refugee applications have continued to increase, so are relatively high. And we have the dynamic of secondary migration from other parts of the country. The uh, crossing over from the border, has that come to a standstill? Has that dropped completely down since the new omnibus bill has come in? Or is that number still as high? Would you happen to have any numbers there? I Can don't have... that arriving in Toronto? Through the speaker, I don't have numbers in front of me. I can advise council that in conversations with senior staff from uh, IRCC, the numbers are significantly down at the irregular crossings. Would you be able to get some numbers in, and share with us? Uh, so we ha Happy to provide that information to you, Councillor. Thank you very much and I appreciate the fact what I foreseen back then you, you did Thank implement. You so much. Yeah, that's Thank, Thank you. I, I told you so you guys were on. Councillor Wong Tam, questions? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, my questions are also largely aligned with the changes that are coming from the federal government around uh, the uh, omnibus bill and the um, and the pro and the prohibition of uh, allowing asylum seekers to uh, to apply uh, once they've already applied once in another country. Um, did did the government of Canada consult with um, uh, this particular body or perhaps yourself uh, prior to making those changes? Through the speaker, there was um, no conversation at the staff level between the city and the federal government. And, uh, and in your opinion, um, because there has been um, uh, alarm raised by those who advocate for refugees and asylum seekers, that this is going to create further chaos and a backlog uh, to the system. Uh, would you agree with those, uh, those proponents? I I think whenever there are changes in the system uh, or the regulations, uh, there is the opportunity for confusion, um, uh, and um, I, I, we would hope that the federal government will implement the changes in the least impactful way. And because these legal changes were, were done largely without consultation, and it's, it's usually cities that have to work through the, the physical resettlement process, uh, for the asylum seekers who have sought um, uh, asylum and apply, uh, applied in their, in their first country of, uh, of, uh, of, of contact, um, they may be here uh, as well. Um, what happens to that individual now? So if they're no longer permitted to, to apply for, for a second country status? Uh, through, through the speaker, we have not done the, the detailed analysis. analysis. Again, the issue of immigration or refugee policy with respect to people coming into the country is not a policy area that the city has, has purview over. And although we don't have purview over the matter, oftentimes the matter falls up, uh, up to us, uh, just like the fact that we are housing um, uh, individuals who are asylum seekers in the shelter system, um, would it be beneficial f and, and maybe perhaps proactive uh, for this uh, refugee capacity, as this, this advisory committee to put, to put together a position paper um, that's, that sort of lets the federal government know what you believe is required in order for us to expedite, uh, clear the backlog, move the system along, uh, and somehow overall uh, streamline the process? Through the speaker, uh, council has communicated to the federal government its desire to see the refugee determination process properly resourced to ensure that uh, there is a timely processing um, of individuals uh, in that system. Um, at a, at a, from a staff level, 
Um, the NGO community and city staff have agreed to continue to work together to identify those kinds of issues. And thank you very much for that, uh, that bit of information. Um, what is the role of the province in all of this? Because uh, we know that cities are, are managing the populations as they're coming in, uh, but obviously uh, a regional coordinator, perhaps a, a province-wide or even a country-wide coordinator would go above the, uh, the purview of the city. Uh, what is the provincial role in all of this? Through the speaker, um, similar to the city, the issue of immigration is a federal jurisdiction. Um, there are specialty programs like the Provincial Nominee Program where the federal government has agreed to work with provinces with respect to uh, certain um, uh, newcomers to the country. Um, from a policy perspective, my advice to Council has always been um, setting policy on who comes into the country is, is federal. Uh, our interest is how quickly we and effectively we can settle people once they're here, regardless of their um, way in. Uh, and effective settlement requires uh, intergovernmental -govern collaboration between all three orders of government. So the province does has traditionally had a role in settlement. So they do have a role, though, because I, I think the, the way you were answering that question, it sounded like they don't have a role. But they the have a role in settlement, role. but not in immigration. Yes, So, but with the settlement process and coordinating all the settlement that's taking place across the cities and local township in Ontario, the provincial government has a role. They, have, they, have, they can participate in, in a leadership capacity, um, and they're really probably the best people to help us move the different pieces and coordinate the conversations, because I know that's critically important Th in, that's, in, that's in what we do as your well. Your last locally. question. Through the speaker, with respect to newcomers generally, yes. With respect to refugees, that has not been the case. Thank you. Councillor Karagiannis to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I got all my questions answered. I uh, would like to thank um, staff for the work that they've done and their candidness on this. And I would like to make sure that we move um, uh, the recommendations. On the item, on favor, carried. Okay, Councillor Matlow is here now, so we'll go back to um, EC 3.4, Review of Dementia Care-Based uh, Models. Councillor Matlow, do you have, do you have a question? Uh, no. No? I just have a quick motion. Yeah. Oh. Okay, uh, no questions. Okay, Councillor Matlow to speak. Uh, thank you. I have a motion. Um, I, I discussed this with uh, with staff. It really just strengthens uh, one of the items, uh, one of the recommendations from committee. And um, and I wanted to um, uh, tell you about an experience that I've had uh, through uh, learning about uh, emotion focused uh, care for people in, uh, with dementia in our homes. Um, for far too long, there and, and it's within you know within. Uh, uh, Toronto's homes, but elsewhere as well. Uh, there's been this sort of traditional um, uh, task uh, task focused uh, uh, approach to dementia care, where uh, residents are treated like patients. Uh, they're 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 treated like uh, children sometimes. Uh, they're talked uh, around or at or over uh, rather than with. And. Um, Recently, I've had uh, the privilege to visit some places that I've seen take an approach that is a culture change that I'd like to see, and I believe all of us would like to advocate for with, uh, within our 10 uh, long-term care homes. Uh, one is at Westburn Manor it's here in Toronto, uh, in Etobicoke. Is that yours? Yes, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Councillor Holiday's ward. And uh, what they're doing is remarkable. They've changed, the, you know, they've, they've done everything from uh, uh, change the color of the walls from that sort of like white institutional hospital looking setting uh, to uh, warm and bright colors. Uh, they have, uh, this may sound silly, but dolls and robotic animals and um, 
things to provide comfort and a sense of stability to those who need it. Uh, they've been reconfiguring the size and dimension of the spaces. Um, and they've done that on their own, just because of their own initiative, but it wasn't from a system, it wasn't from a systems place, and that's why I, and I believe most of you, would like to see us take a leadership role, be a model for the world, so people can come here and say, wow, Toronto is, is leading the way with an emotion focus rather than the just task-oriented uh, appro approach. Um, I also visited in Peel region um, at, um, at Malton Village, uh, they've become internationally renowned for what they've done because what they've done is they've taken on the butterfly approach. And uh, even if you visit, one example, you, you go through the hallways there and they've actually talked to each of the residents about doorways that reflect um, a sense of home, a sense of stability, something that they find comfort in. And then they take vinyl and they actually uh, will redo the doors in a way that it feels like home to them. Um, it's amazing what they do. It feels like a home rather than a facility. And I believe that those of us who have loved ones who, um, who suffer from dementia uh, or, uh, or just care about others who do, uh, or who may want to see our, you know, our long-term care facilities become the kind of homes that maybe one of us or many of us may end up in one day. Uh, this is the culture change. This is the approach that's being recommended uh, uh, from, uh, from really everyone who, who, who understands the issues. Even the consultant recognized that a culture change is needed, and while she didn't prescribe the butterfly approach or greenhouse or one or the other, she did agree that we should be looking at how to uh, improve our approach and, and improve our care throughout all of our facilities. Um, through using emotion-focused approaches, They've also seen, in Peel Region uh, can attest to this, uh, a lower uh, uh, rate of weight loss in the residents. Um, they've seen um, uh, less dependence on antipsychotic drugs. Um, there is a better retainment and better uh, job work environment for, uh, for, the, uh, for the support workers. And they also have a better uh, ratio. Uh, you know, currently we have uh, a, uh, a personal support worker will uh, typically be a ratio during the day 1 to 12. At night it can be up to 1 to 40, which is like absurd. In most, I mean, if you talk to anyone who works in our long-term long care uh, here in Toronto, they will say that just doesn't jibe with the reality of being able to provide more than just a few minutes for each one of those residents. Uh, God forbid there was a fire or a safety concern that they needed to address. So. Um, I endorse the committee's recommendations. I appreciate uh, the committee actively listening, listening to uh, our recommendations and, and to the letter that I submitted. Uh, my motion really refines uh, one of the recommendations to not just kind of build on the great things we've done. Thank you, but, Councilor but, but, it, but actually improve the care within the homes themselves. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any further speakers? So we have the one Motion by Councillor Mallow, if we can put it on the screen. Pardon? Recorded vote. Councillor Bailao, when you're seated. Councillor Fletcher, please. Councillor Perks, please. Councillor Cole, please, your vote. Yep. Councillor Fillion, please. The amendment carries unanimously, 23 in favor. Item as amended, all in favor? Carried. Carried. Councillor Fletcher. Well, this is, uh, Councillor Bailao is holding that. Okay, so. Councillor Bailao. Um, Madam Speaker, I'll release that. Councillor Fletcher has a motion to put forward, so I'll pass the item on to her. Okay, so. let's go back and forth. Councillor well, Fletcher. Well, just to be clear, for the clerks, <laughs> it's not my item, I'm not okay. holding it. 
but uh, I do have a motion. Uh, okay, we're it. dealing with, for members of council, yeah. on page 3, X 4.3, cities, cities, tenants first. Okay? Yes. And as the city manager, uh, we direct the city manager to meet monthly with the chief executive officer of TCHC to update on the progress of tenants first and to report quarterly. Okay. And uh, I don't need to have a long speech, but I think it's a good idea. Yes. And... Uh, would ask for the support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, on the amendment, it's on the screen, on paper, carried. Item is amended, recorded vote. We just might finish in one day. No, you see, people don't want to finish in one day. Not that they can't, they just don't want to. Councillor Pasternak, please. Councillor Pasternak, your vote, please. Councillor Mallow, please. Councillor Layton. Councillor Bailao, your vote, please. The item is amended, carries unanimously, 24 in favor. Okay, great. Yeah, um, yeah. I I think we can do one item before lunch. Page five, VC three point eight. Uh, authority to enter into multi-year agreement with Toronto Arts Council. Deputy Mayor Min Wong, you held the item down. Do you have questions? Um, I actually have asked the questions of um, the general manager. Uh, he hasn't gotten back to me yet. So as soon as I get that information, I'll let you know and we can deal with it. Okay, he's, he's here, did you? I, so he was collecting the information, he, he was going to share it with me. I'd like to review that material first. Okay. So I, I'd prefer not to deal with it right now. All right. So we'll deal that later. All right. Councillor Cressy, quick release and then we'll recess for lunch. Councillor Cressy. Uh, I can do a release of HL 5.1. It's not on the green sheets. It's the item we introduced this morning from the Board of Health. Uh, there it is, considerations of the 2019 provincial budget. I'm prepared to release that with a recorded vote. Does anybody have any questions on it? No? Okay, you have it before you. That's the one that we introduced this morning, HL 5.1. Separate. Uh, there's a request to separate one and two. So we'll vote on number one. Recorded vote. Uh, speaker, my mic is on. <coughs> Councilor Karajanis, please. Councillor Min and Wong, please. Part one of the motion carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Part two, recorded vote. Part two of the motion carries 19 to three. Okay. Yes, Councillor Cressy? Just on a point of personal privilege on that item, 
Uh, for 35 years, Jen Houston, who is the Director of Strategic Support at Toronto Public Health, who's standing here, uh, has served uh, in our city and has played roles. Uh, she started out as a public health nurse and has played every single role imaginable within Toronto Public Health. Uh, this was, this is her last meeting as she is retiring. Uh, we didn't think it was going to be as eventful a month as it true came to be. Uh, but among civil servants, there is no other who has served with distinction and deep care than Jan Houston. And I just want to take a moment to recognize her and I'd ask Council to join me in a round of applause for Jan Houston. Okay, thank you, members of council. We're recessed to two o'clock.